This is a brief introduction to the origin and current state of intellectual property. As of now, the sale of copyrighted and patented goods make up about a quarter of the U.S. economy, 40% of our exports, and it employs about 13% of our population. And this is, includes things like aircraft, auto parts, technology, entertainment. Um, there's a substantial trade in illegal um, Ill illegally made products, counterfeited or pirated. For example, 10% of the world's medications are counterfeited. It's a $200, a $200 billion industry. And uh, our, our federal government has only 20 people nationwide to investigate and process these uh, cases, so you see very little is recovered. Intellectual property really matters for our students, though. Right now, entertainment's the biggest U.S. export, with jobs in that sector growing at three times the rate of the rest of the U.S. economy. Uh, observers think the future of the U.S. economy relies primarily on creativity and innovation. In a nutshell, our children's future is based on intellectual property innovation. This isn't something brand new. Uh, progress in science through the ages has built on the innovation and creativity of those who've gone before, as Isaac Newton's quote attests. Let's go back to the dawn of intellectual property. The first large library was of uh, King Ashurbanipal of Assyria, the first literate ruler, 650 BC. And uh, to protect his 10,000 titles uh, on the back of clay tablets, he had written this in translation, clay tablet of Ashurbanipal, king of the world, king of Assyria. Whoever removes this tablet writes his name in place of my name. May the gods, angered and grim, cast him down, erase his name, his seed in the land. Well, uh, a few centuries later, in the world's largest collection of intellectual property for five centuries, we have a problem with plagiarism in Alexandria. In 200 BC, in the annual poetry contest, the primary judge had to disqualify all but one contestant for plagiarism. Intellectual property issues continue. The biggest library to compete with Alexandria was that at Pergamon in present-day Turkey. Uh, in response, Alexandria prohibited the export of papyrus from Egypt. Uh, the response from Pergamon was to hold a contest for the replacement of papyrus, and the response was parchment. But parchment is not as flexible. You can't roll it up in a scroll. So their solution was to cut it into rectangular sheets and bind them on one corner, one edge. So the format of our modern day book owes itself to an intellectual property dispute. A thousand years later in Venice, uh, the city was interested in attracting foreign artisans uh, to make unique products to trade. And to do this, they passed a law, the first intellectual property law in the world. Translated, any person in this city who makes any new and ingenious, ingenious contrivance not made heretofore in our dominion shall, as soon as it is perfected so it can be used and exercised, give notice to the city, it being forbidden up to 10 years for any other person in any territory of ours to make a contrivance in the form and resemblance thereof without the consent and license of the author. If you violate that, in today's dollars, it was a $7,000 fine. And that law was used, for example, to protect printers who, in this case, patented italic type. Well, that kind of law protecting intellectual property spread from England to the US in 1790 uh, to France. Uh, this image is of Eli Whitney's original patent application to in uh, 1794, just four years after the Patent Act was passed. Uh, the first Global Intellectual Property Act was, did not pass till 1883. 
So in the beginning, the ancient world had no concept of copyright uh, because all copying was laborious. You had to have, have a scribe who knew how to read and write and a quill. Copyright law began around the age of the printing press in response to the printing press's ability for mass copying. It was actually called the printing press law. Uh, it was the right to copy. And it started with uh, the, the right given by English kings to printers to publish things that they approved of. And in response, they had a perpetual monopoly on, with that product. Uh, after the king was overthrown in 1688, Parliament passed a new copyright law giving the author, not the printer, protection. In the United States, Section 8, Clause 8 of the U.S. Constitution reads, to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. In other words, U.S. copyright is based on the U.S. Constitution, which, which says copyright is solely for the public good. It's a system to keep authors creating, not to give special privileges to authors or to um, companies. For most of the U of U.S. history, copyright was regarded as industrial regulation because it restricted publishers, never readers, even if they copied a book or part of it. It was a power exercised by authors over publishers so the public would benefit. And it was beneficial to the public. Everybody understood it. It wasn't controversial. Then along came computer networks, which empowered readers to easily copy and disseminate intellectual property. Publishers requested that the law apply to individuals to protect their copyrighted material. So the law is now a power wielded by publishers over the public, ostensibly to protect authors, but we know publishers get the most benefit. It's now intensely controversial, very hard to enforce, and does it really protect the public more than, let's say, the companies? You get a copyright just by making something original. If you snap a photo, it's instantly copyrighted. Initially, you had to apply for copyright, though, and you were given a 14-year copyright term. You could renew that once. A law was then passed to, a per, to permit a, a thir, an, another 14-year renewal. In this century, we had laws passed to extend the copyright duration to the life of the author plus 50 years, now the life of the author plus 70, up to 120 years maximum. So we've seen the U.S. Pro Constitution prohibits perpetual copyright. It demands a limited term. But every 20 years, recently lobbyists have argued to extend copyright to keep existing works from the public. And we have to ask how this system motivates authors to continue to create uh, because nobody lives 170 years. This graph shows how copyright duration has extended five to 10 times uh, its original length. In addition to extending duration, copyright law has changed to extend the breadth of copyright so that more things are controlled. Uh, computers and networks give publishers the ability to monitor and regulate use, and uh, corporate lawyers suggest now it should be illegal for an owner of an audio CD to make a copy and then a, a copy illegally made should be uh, uh, charged for damages up to one and a half million dollars per CD. Ebooks, The New Frontier, well, if you uh, purchase a, uh, a bestseller uh, for your Amazon Kindle, do you know that you're not allowed to sell it on eBay? You can't loan it to a friend or pass it on to your children. Because the digital rights management is authorized for you alone to use it. So we have some big copyright questions. How are personal freedoms balanced against corporate interests? And what's fair use of copyright material? And how can authors and artists uh, really tailor their, uh, uh, the uses that they permit without jeopardizing their ownership? Looking at it for an, from an artist's perspective, Pablo says, good artists borrow, great artists steal. Just as Isaac Newton said, we make scientific progress by building on the work of others.